We have a wonderful show today, another wonderful data science event. Um, we're really fortunate uh, that we have a distinguished speaker, Dr. Richard Bach, on data climate science. Wanted to, before I introduce you to Richard, uh, let you know what's going on with the data science group. Uh, we are planning a big Hawaiian barbecue pool party in Stapleton on August 23rd. Write that down, Friday, August 23rd. And it's not only for us, but we're joining up with a big data group. Uh, there are actually a couple of big data groups, and we're inviting people from the R, the RUG, uh, uh, R user group, uh, and some other data and technology meetup groups. And we're gonna have a huge Hawaiian bash. We're gonna have kegs of beer. We're gonna have Famous Dave's Barbecue. We're going to have a live DJ. And this is all free. It's being sponsored by Tableau, Cloudera, and O'Reilly Media. So we're really fortunate that we have wonderful sponsors who thought that this was a great idea and decided to sponsor us. And I really do hope to see all of you there. You're going to meet wonderful people um, uh, in the data and the technology world. and. It's one of the things that I think that I have failed at and many of the other meetups really don't do a good job of is trying to get people to network, trying to get them to socialize. And I really feel that that's important and that you'll all get a lot out of meeting people who are in a similar field but may have different interests. I'm also going to ask that um, you not ask questions during the presentation. And the reason is, is that we're live streaming it. Uh, we're also video recording it. We'll post it on YouTube. And the people who are watching it at home can't hear the questions from the back. And it really breaks up the video and uh, uh, makes it into a, a not smooth presentation. So please refrain from asking questions during the presentation, but wait until the end. And at the end, both Richard and myself will be happy to answer all of your questions. And if you can, uh, save your questions and just come up over here and speak near the microphone so all the people at home can hear your questions. Unfortunately, Dr. Arvin Sathi, a friend of mine, was to give the presentation on data science versus data engineers. Unfortunately, he had a conflict of interest and is unable to come here today. And he told me that I would be uh, the right person to give this uh, talk. So I'm going to go ahead and give the presentation. Dr. Sathi will uh, present on another topic at a future event. So I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Richard Bach of NCAR. Uh, climate data science has made incredible, incredible uh, advances in the last 10 years, especially in predicting climate. It's still not perfect. It's still very difficult to predict the climate. There's so many different variables. But in the world of business that I come from, we have a lot to learn from Dr. Loft and what the climate data people are doing. You can apply these principles to business. In fact, we're way behind. So we have a lot to learn uh, from Dr. Loft about uh, the different data science principles and the technologies that have been put to work in the climate data field. Dr. Law, thank you. Well, thank you. I, I feel exactly the same way. I have a lot to learn from the uh, business analytics. So uh, maybe we're just all operating on a misunderstanding of each other's expertise. It reminds me of my uh, grandmother when she was widowed, married a guy, and they both thought each other was uh, wealthy. And then when they got married, they found out what their real bank accounts were. They were somewhat disappointed by that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's sort of where we are with, with respect to getting our hands around this thing. Now, uh, what I'd like to do today is to talk to you about the, the problems and the opportunities and the things that are going on in the atmosphere-related sciences, and in particular about climate science, uh, you know, just to make sure that we have common uh, terminology, I'm using this pretty common 
uh, big data terminology we're talking about volume, variety, and uh, velocity. There's now value and veracity, and, and soon there will be many more Bs, I suspect, from a literary point of view. But um, in my view, uh, big data is a relative term. We have problems that differ by several, several orders of magnitude in the size of the data, but because of the circumstances, let's say an instrument that's on an airplane flying or a spacecraft or a computing center, we have a big data problem which is of a different size because it speeds and feeds of the infrastructure we're dealing with. So essentially it's a relative term. So what am I going to talk about? Well, first of all, I want to make sure that you understand uh, what the National Center for Atmospheric Research does in some general sort of uh, way. You know, we're your neighbors up on the, the hill down here in the uh, Table Mesa. I, I want to talk about the Earth System modeling itself, uh, the background behind that, because when you look at the uh, terms driving the amount of data that we're looking at, modeling by far is the uh, biggest contributor to uh, as a data source. Uh, we will then uh, look at some of the data sets, the tools and services that have grown up around this ecosystem. One of our advantages, I think, is, is that meteorology has been going on for about 100 years or more. Uh, India, I was just there this February, India has monsoon records from the 1880s. And a very good British imperial monsoon records. So we have all of this kind of information. We've been doing this for a while. That's a, so there are a lot of systems, organizations, and protocols. Even in the height of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union exchanged atmospheric data. So you know it's a it's an area of international cooperation that has existed for many decades, transcends national boundaries and interests. However, uh, that's also a liability. We've had that infrastructure around a long time before uh, there were relational databases or before there was an AgriDuce and all of, this, all of these wonderful things uh, that, that are technologies people are using. So in some ways, our systems have a legacy liability, but they also have a lot of uh, things that new fields don't have in terms of agreed upon standards, and, and international bodies that can help move things forward in a cooperative way. Uh, finally, I'm going to talk about something I've spent eight years of my life bringing about with the help of many other people, uh, which is the NCAR Wyoming Supercomputing Center. This is uh, uh, NCAR's new uh, computing center in partnership with the uh, State of the University of Wyoming. Uh, it is where we are doing a lot, almost all of our modeling activities at this point. It's also where we house our observational data sets and our curated data. And uh, that system and its design is influenced by uh, the increasing importance of data, as you can see. Uh, I'll also talk about the future of data center computing in this field. Uh, as you can imagine, we're facing a lot of uh, screening factors in their infrastructure, and we're also dealing with the, the fact that our infrastructure and software for solving these data problems are going to have to co-evolve. Uh, this is nothing new. We've been co-evolving our models uh, for maybe half a century with the underlying computing technology. So let's go a little bit about uh, NCAR. So NCAR's mission sort of uh, is uh, related to the atmospheric sciences. Uh, the true joke is it's the National Center for Alpine Recreation uh, or the National Center for Acquiring Resources, depending on who you talk to. But the, the, the atmospheric research mission started out very narrowly defined as strictly the atmosphere. But as the climate problem has evolved, we've had to spread our activity to something that I will call the Earth System Sciences, meaning that we're not just looking at the atmosphere, but we have to look at all the systems that interact with the atmosphere, including human activity. So air pollution in Beijing falls on our plate, as does uh, the global ocean circulations, as does uh, pine fields. 
uh, and ecosystem imbalances are caused by uh, changes in climate. So everything across many orders of uh, magnitude of scales, I have a snowflake down here, uh, I have the mosquito that represents some of the studies that, that have been done in epidemiology. We work with people in Africa to predict outbreaks of encephalitis, which are very sensitive to particular characteristics of uh, rainy and dry seasons and so forth. So it's a pretty big plate. It's gotten much bigger than when it was founded in the 60s. Now, why we do it is obviously uh, the societal impact. I must say that it, the slide, imagine that you're looking at these slides in an aquarium. So there's kind of a blue tint to it. It's in the back, there should be some fish in front of Somehow the projector is, is turning black into purple and white into a pale blue. But hopefully it doesn't look too bad. Uh, but you know, we have so many things that happen. Uh, Hailstorms that wipe out crops and droughts and floods, uh, hurricanes, uh, El Nino cycles that influence uh, fisheries. Uh, all these, all these things are uh, really about impacting people. And then, of course, the other piece, which uh, goes on here, is that uh, you know people actually are now we're convinced that are affecting the weather and the climate through our emissions and so forth. And so that's added a whole other uh, concept to our mission now, which is to assess things like adaptation and mitigation efforts related to climate change, assessing the impacts of various kinds of future change on society. So this is a broader mission than when we originally started. How we do it, we're more than a computing center with some data sets, of course we have uh, radars, we have observational aircraft, we have a small air force, like Gulf Street 5, C-130, these planes fly missions, uh, you know, several missions a year typically in which they collect uh, observational data of an important uh, phenomenon. Uh, we have uh, satellite uh, projects, this is one of the top I'll talk about a little bit, the cosmic uh, radio occultation experiment. So let's just look at the airplane for a second. The airplane is uh, a significant source of data in, in the form of observations. And I'll show you one example of it in a little bit. It has uh, the ability to go into the stratosphere and take samples. We also do a fair amount of observational things. This is something that the uh, Solar Observatory uh, section of our organization is called the High Altitude Observatory. They have a, a solar observatory that they float on a balloon. And this thing uh, flies missions in which we observe the sun with this device and then it lands in some farmer's field. <coughs> now, <coughs> this may in fact be the, the source of a number of UFO reports as a result. Uh, because if that comes down in your yard, you're like, oh my god, what is it? So we do have those sorts of things going on. And then COSMIC, which is this occultation experiment, we have a system of uh, GPS-like satellites that operate in low Earth orbit. And what they do is uh, they look at the, the, uh, the propagation of uh, radio waves near the Earth's atmosphere, and they actually have an indirect measurement of water vapor, which is a very hard thing to handle. Of course, water vapor is critically important in understanding the Earth's system. And then the thing that's near and dear to my heart uh, is this Wyoming Supercomputing Center, which, which houses our petascale uh, supercomputer in the data storage systems. Uh, and you can go uh, visit this if you're interested and go to the visitor center. And it's near Cheyenne, Wyoming. It's uh, about five miles west of town. And it has a, a little interpretive set of interpretive displays. And you can actually go and look in the windows and and see what a supercomputer looks like. Now, let's move on to just a, a bit of history and background about Earth system modeling, because uh, the reason I, I think it's important to understand Earth system modeling is, as I said, it's, it's one of the major sources of uh, data coming out of our, in 
in our field. And most of it is focused on, some, in some form or another, trying to understand the impacts of future climate, future weather patterns on, on human systems. Even if you're not interested in climate modeling, uh, if you're in some other industrial field, the insurance industry, or the energy industry, or even defense, you will run up against the uh, issues related to climate change. So, for example, the Department of Defense is interested to know what it should uh, what it should think about in terms of estimating operating costs of various bases based on the climate change effects. So, a simple example is if it gets hotter, you have to run air conditioners longer. So, I suppose that the cost of air conditioning will go up. A very trivial example. But let's say you have, a, if you're an oil company and you have an oil terminal and the sea level rise uh, causes that oil terminal to have to be re-engineered, that's going to cost you a lot of money. So there are a tremendous number of places where this stuff touches other <coughs> industries. So what I want to do is go back to 1922 for a second. And, and there's a really visionary guy in our field who is not recognized. And it's a guy named Louis Pryor Richardson. He's not well known outside the field, but he's something of a of a god in numerical weather prediction. He was uh, caught up in World War One, but he was a pacifist. So what he did is he drove an ambulance, uh, and that's a picture of him as a young man driving an ambulance. Now he was a brilliant mathematician, and he was trying to figure out how to simulate the equations, partial differential equations, governing the atmosphere that had been written down. Uh, Near the turn of the century. People use kind of heuristic rules of thumb for predicting where a storm front would go. You know, like it moved an inch on the map yesterday, so it'll move an inch on the map today, kind of approach. He wanted to actually solve the equation, so he asked himself, sitting in a French barn, uh, you know, can I do this by hand? So he created a little grid of points and he gridded up. Europe and he entered some data that had been published and he tried to do a forecast by hand. Uh, he must have had a lot of spare time on his hands. But in 1922 he wrote this whole experiment up and it almost worked. He, he only had a small problem related to his ability to actually initialize the equations consistently or he would have gotten a good forecast. But he wrote up his, his work even though he didn't quite learn. And in this document in 1922, he wrote this, this little section, and I won't read it to you, but I want you to understand just a couple of things. He's imagining if, if he could organize people who he called computers. So a computer was a job, you know, you could get a job as a computer, you know, and organize these people and put them in a stadium and sit them down and hand them their piece of the problem and tell them, calculate a way and then when you need to share a number with your neighbors, do that with, I don't know, a, a slip of paper. And he imagined this whole thing going on. And the beautiful part about it is, is that this, this imagining is exactly how we do this, except we replace the people with Intel chips. Yeah, that's basically, I mean, he nailed the idea. And in fact, he had this, this notion of a grid with columns in it. He had this notion of this stadium. But there was a conductor, which I guess you could call the operating system, and it said, okay, now we're going to do the precipitation. <laughs> now we're going to do the winds. You know, and, and he had that image, you know, sort of an Albert Hall of weather prediction. Now, that was uh, more or less uh, stated as a, a fanciful idea. And then in 1947, there were several big events. One is Jackie Robinson broke into Major League Baseball, integrating it for the first time. Uh, once again, UFOs come up in my talk. Uh, the Air Force found something that Roswell was a famous weather one. But the one thing that I'm most interested in is uh, the invention of the transistor. Uh, the transistor was the game changer in 1947. It was about an inch long. It looked like the 
hair can go in bad. Uh, a picture over there. And of course, the creation of that device changed the world. And, you know, the whole history of everything we've been trying to do to realize Richardson's dream hinges on the fact that we've now shrunk this thing down to 200 atoms across. Right? This is a micron micrograph of a transistor now. It's so thin that you have quantum tunneling effects that take uh, uh, current actually going across that little junction there that's only got the width of a DNA molecule. So this, uh, this situation, just to compare it with the influenza virus, those are on the same scale. So transistors have gotten the size of the influenza virus. Interesting, interesting. Now, from a computing point of view, it's been that we've gone from something like this, which is the ENIAC, which actually did the first correct numerical weather simulation in 1950. It had tubes. It looks like a science fair experiment. And we slowly see the progress here towards uh, more. Here we have transistors replacing tubes, but still discrete devices. We see integrated circuits appearing in the 70s, we see uh, fairly much the modern structure of a, of a motherboard coming into existence. And of course, this is the one in our current supercomputer, very similar. All we've done is just keep shrinking here. And of course, uh, people know about Moore's Law. This is the thing that's driven this. It's an amazing fact that the power of uh, computers has increased exponentially. It means that our the laptop that I have right now would have been on the top 500 list of fastest machines in the world. So I can take it back to 1999. So that 1999 doesn't seem too long ago to me. So that's a pretty amazing factor. Now, uh, most of that speed has come from going more parallel. Um, we were at eight CPUs in 1986 with the Cray 2. We're now the big, biggest machine in terms of core count that I'm aware of is one and a half million CPUs. It's in Florence Livermore. So we've had this sort of 200 fold increase in speed, and we've had 200,000 increase in the number of processors. So parallelism is definitely the driving. Paradigm in supercomputing. Now, that's great. We've been very focused on improving the models, and we do this in this iterative process that I'm showing here, where you, you have your physical system, you write down these physical laws like Richardson did, you figure out a mathematical method for them, and you feed the data initial, let's say, an initial state into the computer, you run your simulation, you get the results, and somehow you magically produce a number which you compare to reality. And if it agrees, then all is good. If not, you try to improve the model. And so we've been in that iterative process since about 1969. This is the first climate model that was ever run uh, in the US anyways, 1969. It's a five degree resolution. That means one grid point for Colorado, one for New Mexico, one for Utah, one for Arizona. You could imagine that that's not exactly going to resolve the Rocky Mountains, right? This had two layers. So it was lower atmosphere and upper atmosphere. So not a very detailed model in that sense, but that's what we had then. The interesting thing about this is, is that as we go along, we've looked at several areas where we could improve the model and try to figure out, given what we have for computing resources, where do we put it? Do we put it in improving the resolution? Do we put it in increasing the run length, like the amount of simulated time? Do we increase the complexity of the model, add more processes, include termites, let's say, whatever, Increase the ensemble size, get better statistics. It's important to point out that climate modeling is a business of statistical mutants. Right? The difference between weather and climate is exactly 
the difference between trying to predict the role of a, die, a given realization of the dice and trying to predict your odds of getting a seven. It's the same business. So the issue with this is uh, trying to maintain some kind of balance that optimizes improvement in the models. If you get a faster computer, you try generally to uphold those things a little bit. Now, let's look at uh, resolution. Uh, this is what the United States looks like with a 400 kilometer resolution, sort of in the war in Washington in 1969. It's pretty 2400 eyesight. Uh, as you refine this, this starts to look like a salt and flour map I might have made in junior high school or elementary school. This is, I don't know if they still do the salt and flour. They probably made virtual salt and flour maps or something. But if you get down to 10 kilometers, this starts to look like a real topo map, you know, with all the mountains resolved. The problem with it is, is that the cost of generating something like this, both in terms of computing and in data, increased geometrically. In other words, if I go and cut the, the lattice facing in this model by half, I have to have typically eight times as much data and 16 times as much compute. Now, while we were improving the models, we also had to improve the numerical algorithms. I won't go into these, but you should be aware of the fact that you know, we haven't just done the same numerical method. We have had to invent mathematics as we went along. I think we're on the same trajectory now with data. We're co-evolving now in the sense that now we're having to take a raw, strong look at our data side of the equation and evolve our methods with the infrastructure of the data side. But this is what happened in computing. And it's a good thing to try and learn from what happened on that side. Math evolved along with computers and along with models. People made up mathematics to solve these problems. Now, what we've ended up with is a model of models, meaning that each component of the atmosphere has its own little piece of model. And each one of those might be a couple hundred thousand lines of code. They talk to each other, and they form the Earth system. So we have ocean, land, ice, glaciers, uh, the atmosphere, of course. So you end up with something that looks like this. This is a little graphical simulation showing sea ice sloshing around. This is probably, um, well, when it melts, you'll see a season go by. But basically, we're doing a whole enchilada dynamically, meaning the ice is talking to the ocean, the ocean is talking to the atmosphere. It's raining, that's freshening the water in the oceans, and so forth. So it's a complex, nonlinear system with all the feedbacks that you can really possibly want. So if you go down here, you, know, you can see when you spin up one of these models, you get the currents. This is a crucio. Those little swipes of yellow are actually uh, typhoons that are sweeping along and cooling off the sea surface temperature. So this is quite accelerated in the time scale. Now, this system that we built, why did we why did we build it? Why don't we just look at observations and try and figure stuff out from observations? Well, supercomputers and, and models are really useful for doing things that you could never do in reality. So for example, uh, you know, if you have a simulation of what's going on in the center of the Earth, you can actually study the center of the Earth. You're never going to be able to go to the center of the Earth, Jules Verne notwithstanding. You can't go there and actually make measurements. So the experiments in climate science that you have look like this. Uh, you know, you run, so this is a, a kind of rendition of the hockey stick diagram, except that we put models in with the observations and the observations here the instrumental record is in black red is a paleo climate simulation that was run for a thousand years uh, 
it tracks along with the observations. Then you get the blue, which is the experiment, which is really hard to do uh, in our world, which is running the climate system forward without the industrial revolution. And then you run, and then you compare that with the observations and with the simulation, which is this. This difference is what all the hoo-ha is about with climate change, right? This, this separation is the model saying, if people hadn't had the industrial revolution and CO2 had stayed where it was, this would be the difference in the temperature, average temperature of the Earth. Now, that's, that particular experiment is hard to do in reality unless you go back in time and like, you know, kill off all the inventors. Victorian era or something, right? Get rid of Watt and Fulton, you know, just make sure nothing happens there. So we have that separation in, in the simulations. And that is just one line of reasoning, right? One of the things that people make the mistake about is to under, understand this very simplistically and think that, we, that the scientists look at this and say, Oh, climate change is real. You know, not true. This is just one of many lines of reasoning that feed into that line of argumentation. So it's oversimplistic to say that that in any way proves it, but that supports the mechanism by which people think it's happening. Now, people also do. Uh, future projections every five years there's something called the IPCC. You probably are familiar with it from the point of view of, of uh, you know, Al Gore uh, winning the Nobel Prize, right? That was associated with the last IPCC. Each IPCC is a kind of global assessment, a competition of, let's say, 22 climate models around the world trying to intercompare with one another to see what they get. Uh, this shows something like the drought conditions that can be expected uh, out in the rest of the century. I won't go into the details of that, but you know, to get the idea that people take what these models are doing and now try to project, they try to say, well, if we keep adding CO2 at some particular defined rate, uh, what will happen to this climate application? So, just to give you a quick picture, this is just some of the details of the, the model that NCAR uh, contributes to and is uh, responsible for integrating together. It's about 1.3 million lines. It's been around for a couple decades. Uh, these models represent the contributions of hundreds of, of scientists. So they're very complicated. I, I spent about 10 years of my life contributing maybe 20,000 lines to this. Okay. So if you, want, if you divide that out and you figure how many years of people's lives that represents, and that's an average, you get a sense of what we're talking about. I would not want to do that again. <laughs> it's a little bit like water torture, you know. People, you know, when you we're trying to get an algorithm into this code, people look at it and they say, well, you know, I really don't like the Icelandic load that your model produces. Sorry, you know, I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> what to do about Iceland? I don't speak Icelandic. So you have a lot of ways that you can fail in these things. Now, to get to the, the key point, it's like, how do you validate these models? How do you know that they're not just telling you what you want to hear? And I think the first thing you do is you look at the internal consistency checks. So there's energy and mass conservation. There are test cases with known solutions that you compare these things to. And most importantly, we challenge the models with observations. So we have the ability to run these in forecast mode which means you take your atmospheric model and the climate and you run it, you try to forecast Katrina with it and see what happens. 
And, you know, you can also do this thing of looking at mean quantities. So, so here's an example of the first thing. I can make that. This is Katrina. The dots are observations. The hurricane here is being shown. Uh, tra tracks very well. Katrina was noteworthy in being a very predictable hurricane. Some hurricanes are, are difficult to predict. This one was fairly straightforward, but it shows. I'm trying. What I'm trying to get across to you is, is that if your model uh, doesn't follow reality, you you can challenge it in this way. Find out why did it stray up? What happened? You do enough analysis, you get some clues to how to improve your model. So, likewise, this is a convergence study. This is taking an observational mean number of extra tropical cyclones, which just means winter, these are winter storms in the entire world. Between 1980 and 2005, it's a pretty remarkable fact that there's about 800 a year on average. That's that black line. If you run a model with a, a two degree resolution, you get about half the number you ought to get. So you can say, okay, what happens if I run a model with slightly better resolution, you get about two thirds of what you should get. And if you run a model at 0.7 degrees, you get pretty good agreement with the observed number. So there's a notion that at least for that observable, you're getting convergence in, with the physical quantity at a particular length scale. The problem is you're not done there because there are other physical quantities and things that you would want to look at. Uh, this is a picture of hurricanes. Uh, there's a couple, actually typhoons. There's one going after Korea or, or Japan right, right here. This resolution is about the first resolution as you in, improve your resolution where you start to see actual per, realistic hurricanes forming. So if you're interested in hurricane statistics and climate models, having a, a 70 kilometer model that converges winter storms isn't good enough. You have to have something that gives realistic hurricanes. So you want 35 kilometers. Well, if you're interested in clouds, clouds form at one kilometer scales. When I was driving in, there's a thunderstorm right over the, my data center uh, in Wyoming. And looking at it uh, with some concern, but it could, the, the whole thunderstorm was very high and very compact. It couldn't have been more than five kilometers across, maybe 10. But I mean, these are the length scales of cloud systems. And so, you know, we're on this modeling kick, right? And we're just driving down on these, let's get higher resolutions, let's get more stuff in these models, let's make them more expensive. And this is where I hit the first tug of the data black hole. Is that when this happened in 2009, we we're running one of these simulations and we were improving the scalability and performance of the model on a machine uh, at Nix, a Cray system. And we had worked really hard and we'd gotten two years per day. And the, the uh, data jockey on the project came and said, you know, it's taking me 12 years to process one year of simulation data. And you don't have to do a lot of math to say, you know, we, we need to stop improving the performance of the model, right? Because there's nothing to be gained by that because now the bottleneck is the data. And I have to admit that being a modeling guy, this is the first time when I smacked my forehead into the brick wall, that's what it took for me to go, this is the rate determining step. This is the problem. From now on, when we run problems, this is, this is going to be the thing we're going to have to deal with. Now the second tug was last year when they were completing the next, uh, the, the, the most recent IPCC. And here we had two petabytes of data and uh, 
we looked into how fast we were process post-processing this data in order to refine it down to about 150 terabytes of, of uh, model data for distribution of community. Uh, and we found out that was 20 megabytes a second. It was, serial, it was a serial piece of code. It was accessing the data stupidly, just chopping it up into really small I.O. transactions. Uh, well, you know, there was a meeting about six months out from the deadline in which somebody finally divided 20 megabytes a second into two petabytes and said, you know, that's three years. Uh, you know, we have six or seven months to deliver this package of, of results. So in this case, it was like, okay, we have to figure out how to speed up our analysis by a factor of six. Now, the heroic efforts means that instead of writing a code that was six-way parallel to do this, it meant that we, we made people work through the 4th of July weekend, and we got extra people working on it. So in this case, our computers really were people again. <laughs> so we were just discovering that we had this serial process. We can kind of get people to work on different data sets and speed it up. But it was, uh, we call it a near-death experience because everybody was very concerned that this late in the game, we were just discovering this. Right? Now, these pesky modelers have a projection for where they're going to be. Uh, and this is a, an exponential scale. This is just NCAR's climate data model, model data output, I should say. One EB means one exabyte, okay, so a thousand petabytes. Um, and we're, according to, the, so these, we believe parts are historical. And the straight part is extrapolation. But what you can see there is, is that by about nine years, we're going to be dealing with exabyte sized model output. And that's because people are chasing these resolution and complexity issues with the models, and they're, they're going to wear us out with that. So I put down for our brand new data center, that's the size of the the memory in the supercomputer, that's the size of the disk in the supercomputer, and that's all the tape that we have uh, funding to procure by 2016. So if you look at it, it's kind of, a, if only we were only doing climate modeling, but we're also doing some meteorology and some other stuff. But let's just look at it from a climbing modeling point of view. It's a pretty close call. Uh, that we will be able to even just archive it uh, and afford to be able to archive it, let alone processing this stuff. So this just by itself is a huge uh, exponential problem. So the first part of my talk is summarized with this. Somewhere in the pursuit of better models, we just forgot about the data. And we just started waking up. I woke up in 2009. A lot of my colleagues woke up last year in the near-death experience, as I call it. But you, I, I, in some ways, it's human nature is like you have to almost lose your job because of the data problem before you actually take it seriously. Maybe that's just human nature. So I want to go over a little bit about now turn out flip up, forget about modeling, just so you know where the source of this problem is on the modeling side. And now let's look at some of the data and tools. So I promise you, if you are waiting for data, you will see some of these things. Okay, so NCAR's research data archive is, uh, I, I put this first because it really is, in some sense, our crown jewel of curated, uh, QA'd, Reanalyzed data products, synoptic global uh, sources that are used by the community extensively for doing studies of various kinds. So when I when I try to compare how many winter storms there really are, I have to go to something like this data set in order. This is ground truth. 
So this is a very valuable set of bytes. And you know, people have this notion that these kind of data sets get more valuable as they age, like mind wine, whereas modeling data kind of becomes less valuable because the models are always improving. So this is really like mind wine. So the data catalogs here have meteorological, remote sensing, they have uh, operational weather forecast model outputs, but like 50 years of them. So you can go back and look at the storm event that happened in the 1970s with the data that was produced by the forecasting centers in those days. And we have things like land use, topography, bathymetry information in there. Now the same thing's happening to this uh, data set that's happening to all the other data sets, which is it's getting bigger uh, and more or less exponentially. The red dot here is the number of users that are accessing this on a monthly basis. And the green bars are the amount of data delivered on a monthly basis to the community. So I think last year, for example, in 2012, we, uh, we delivered orders of you know, hundreds of terabytes of data to the community where they downloaded this stuff to, to look at it. Now, uh, to show you a, a little bit about the structure of this data set, here I have on the one side the number of files in red in certain bins of file size. So this is like megabytes of files, one, 0 to 1 megabyte, 1 to 2, 2 to 3. It goes all the way up to uh, 10, 10 gigabyte files, just to give you a sense of how many files there are, and then the blue is the volume of the data within that, that bin. So even though you have, let's say, a whole lot of files here, and I have maybe uh, 1,200 files in this 20 to 30 megabyte bin, they're actually relatively small in size, the total footprint. If you integrate it under the, the curve, it's asked how many uh, how big the thing is, it's something over uh, a petabyte of data in, in this whole thing. There are about 600 different data sets of one kind or another. Now, I just want to show you one of the reasons this stuff gets bigger. This is just the upper atmosphere archive. It's just taking one of these archives. I mean, it's just saying number of reporting stations as a function of time beginning in 1920 and, and going out to 19, oh, well, like 2000, I think, something like that. And so you can see that, uh, you know, that's the story of the 20th century uh, going into the 21st, is uh, the number of observations has also been something that's grown up because of, of uh, the advancements in technology. They have this kind of nice little thing. That's 1920, Washington, D.C. was the place observing the upper atmosphere on there. So we have a rather limited synoptic data set there. But if you move this forward and then look at this, this is going to advance by five years from 1935, and just look at apparently the, the Nazi Germany didn't contribute in 1940 for some reason. This is always all that international collaboration I was talking about didn't always work. But if you look, you can just see the density of the observations increasing. And of course, this is uh, this is a fixed ground station. We now, of course, have satellites and all kinds of other things that have even higher database. But I think it's interesting to realize that one of the things we always struggle with with these data sets is lousy information in the past. Uh, and and if you look at how we construct medieval temperature records, that's a even uh, more proxy data, more uh, you know, Chinese uh, scrolls and, and things like that that they used to reconstruct these kind of things. If only Charlemagne had had weather satellites, we'd be in a lot better shape. Because if you think about the climate problem, 
you know, one way you can say it is we only really have good information over a short period of time, but a lot of climate events are longer period of time things. So we, we're struggling with not being able to see all of the information we'd like to see. And that's reflected in this thing. So, so the only problem with what I'm describing is it can't last this way because we can't have a system where people go and browse data and download big chunks of it and look at it. I don't have to download big chunks of data from Google to, to find out something about Kim Kardashian. You know, I just ask it about Kim Kardashian, it gives me little bits of information that, that help me to find out more. It doesn't like download all ephemeral, ephemeral, you know, pop culture figures as a data set. You know, we don't do it that way. So I call this moving beyond data portals. You know, we we have to have both ways to subset and work with the data, but also to publish data into these things without human intervention, and ways to preserve the data, graft it onto this sort of find the data, get the data sort of paradigm that we have now on lists and data files. Things. People may be surprised to realize that these data sets, given their age and so forth, are not organized in relational databases and things like that. They're just basically, uh, you know, if you go, you can get an account and go look. They're, they're catalogs of data. You can, you can go into that catalog and, and look for what you want, but it's fairly low tech. So, one of the other data sets that is very important is this is the, the data set that actually, uh, the data system that, that, that helped publish the observation or the uh, simulation data sets that caused the near death experience. So, this is what they call the Earth System Grid, and we're a node in that. And um, so, this is uh, that two petabytes of data boiled down to 150 terabytes. Even though we have 150 terabytes, people are downloading 110 terabytes a month. So nearly the whole volume uh, is going out per month, to obviously different pieces to different people and so forth. But it's very active, it's very hot, it's a hot center for, for downloads. We are working very hard with these kind of things to build subsetting <coughs> technology so you don't have to get big chunks of can ask for small pieces, but there isn't a lot of server-side analysis, even so, built into these systems. Um, I mentioned off the air, airplane, so I thought that you need to see one of these velocity problems that we have. This is a kind of holographic camera that takes holographic pictures of cloud droplets as a plane flies through uh, clouds and uh, the, the hologram aspect of it ends up generating a huge amount of data when you reconstruct the whole hologram into a three-dimensional structure and so here you know the data volumes don't sound very big but they're on an airplane you know there's two terabytes generated on a single flight on this airplane and typically what has to happen is this whole workflow has to reciprocate in time for the next mission. So there's a there's a time constraint in this in this uh, workflow cycle of taking this and visualizing it and analyzing it and then planning the next mission. When you get those kinds of uh, activities then uh, you're now you now find yourself calculating bandwidths and trying to figure out how can I get the processing time and the bandwidth to the place where I can actually make this work. So this is an example where I'm not talking petabytes, but I am talking a problem that strains the cyber infrastructure. And all those missions that we flown, similar to the RDA, are in a uh, field catalog. So we've flown about 500 uh, field programs over the his 400 field programs over the history of uh, our Air Force, and each of those produces 
uh, data sets which can be analyzed. So this is sort of an observational aircraft oriented analog to the, the research data archive. For uh, variety, I like to, like to include this one. So when you look at the Arctic Data Information Service, or APCAVIS, it is um, it is really small. It's about two terabytes, but it includes a thousand different data collections from 100 principal investigators all working on the Arctic. Some of these are like ice core profiles, very compact. So the permeability of some ice core is the data object in this. And that could be um, sort of Excel spreadsheet size, but then there are thousands and thousands and thousands of ice cores. And so this uh, this is really one of these data variety or data mesh of problems. Uh, and the data is really in different formats. Some of this comes from uh, social scientists. Some of this comes from biologists, oceanographers, climate scientists, geo scientists. So it's all over the place in terms of discipline. And so there are no common formats. And so what this project is focused on is developing a standard sort of uh, metadata template, a metadata template that allows people to self-publish and put their data in a format that people can understand and work with. So the notion self-publishing is a really hard topic uh, to automate the process of, of representing that. And that's, I think, one of the things you have to do with these uh, eclectic data sets. So finally, I want to talk about some infrastructure here. So you remember this dream of Richardson, this, this stadium? Well, this is what the stadium actually looks like. This is our facility in Cheyenne. It's, a, it's about the size of a Walmart or something like that. It's 100,000 square feet. Uh, it takes a couple of megawatts of electrical power to power one of these. This is our computer. It's a one and a half petaflop machine. It's about 100 racks all together, 60, 63 compute racks. Uh, it's called Yellowstone. And I think Yellowstone really is Richardson's parallel computer made real. And I always think that he would be very amazed to see what one of those actually looks like. Now, the thing about Yellowstone is that we thought we would be very innovative and push the data-centric design of this machine as far as we thought we could. So, uh, you know, in the past, we bought a supercomputer and got a, a disk attachment on it. And in this procurement, we bought a file system and got a peripheral that was a calculator that would go on that. So this is the core of the system and the way we think about it. So this central file system that we got is about 11 petabytes. That's a thousand times the print holdings of the Library of Congress, if you think about it that way. But even so, we, we're going to have to expand it, I think, to 17 petabytes. Uh, next year, just to keep up. So the idea was to create a really big place to hold the RDA and these valuable data collections, the model output, and then the distilled model output that is considered valuable for inner comparison, sharing with colleagues. And so, so our hope in designing this thing was that this would be the mosh pit where all of the workflows would happen without, in the past we've written this stuff out to archive, read it back, added two numbers together, and wrote it back to archive. And so, you, you know, you end up thrashing tape drives if you do that, basically. So this is kind of giant disk, disk cache around which our data feeds to outside people and centers, our analysis systems, 
our mass, our tape archives, and our secret computer would huddle around this campfire, and that's how you could do it. Now, I think even though we thought we were being radical, we did not go far enough in the shifting towards uh, focusing on data. This is just one metric. It's comparing us to a bunch of other uh, NSF and uh, supercomputing centers and comparing how many bytes of disk and how many flops did you buy in your supercomputer? And then what's that ratio, bytes to flops? And if you look, bigger is better. We went about uh, between seven and 10 on that ratio, depending on whether you talk about phase one and phase two of our disk space. Uh, other systems that are doing sort of three and four, five is uh, San Diego, almost got to six, it's almost comparable. But the point is we thought we were going farther than anybody was gonna go. We, I, I think we're now pretty convinced that this number, uh, in one way or another, needs to look more like 60 instead of 10 uh, to really do uh, the stuff we want to do. Um, now, the other thing that you have to have in this sort of system is an interconnect. This is this uh, this picture looks really bad on the screen, but it's trust me, it looks it's, it's great up here. <laughs> this is just showing that these are this is a compute node, and each link is uh, another level in the tree that interconnects everything. Looks a bit like a dandelion, but uh, each of those links is about a thousand times, order a thousand times faster than your DSL line. And it's trying to move all this data around inside the computer. And integrated with that is the, is the uh, data analysis system that talks to this thing over the same kind of, similar, well, similar kind of fabric so that it can move data back and forth to the supercomputer. And I always put this in there because this is this is how you're wired, and it's starting. To, I don't know. It's starting to look to me like we're getting to that level of complexity, though maybe not. Uh, this is what it actually looks like. It looks a lot more like a plate of we than a nicely packaged human brain. Uh, one thing we learned from this exercise is really important to label. All of these things. <laughs> we're actually, uh, because of a manufacturing defect, we're going to have to pull a lot of these out and replace them with a ball, but, um, which is very inconvenient. But as you could imagine, but I just want you to see, you know, I, I don't know, I don't really know your guys' background, uh, you know, how much you deal with the infrastructure, but this is what the infrastructure looks like and makes your stuff happen. And not all of it's beautiful, but it, it works. So, let's look at the future. I, you know, this black hole effect is coming from a real physical thing. I don't know that people realize about the, how these rotating mechanical platters that we have don't really keep up with electronic speeds. So, disk speeds and access times are really, really dopey, and they're not, and they're not keeping up. And, and what is forcing us to do, and what you see with our design, is we're trying to move the analysis closer to the computer have fewer stages of putting the data farther away and bringing it back again. Uh, right now we're trying to cache it onto this, but eventually I think we're gonna have to move it even closer. The other thing the near-death experience convinced us of is that the, all the analysis software has to go parallel. And uh, there can't be a serial bottleneck in this system or we will just eventually choke on the other thing that's happening, and because everybody is saying similar kinds of, of whiny things, is that uh, there's a lot of new data technologies coming along. I mean, I know people.
people probably heard it about SSDs. There's uh, uh, non-volatile RAM coming. There's uh, stacked memory. There's a whole bunch of innovations to try and up bandwidth, lower latencies, reduce power consumption, get the data closer uh, to the computation. All of that stuff is coming because of the fact that we're at this crossover point. Maybe it was in 2009, maybe it was in 2012. Somewhere in there we crossed over where, I, I say it this way, that mining the data for scientific knowledge is, is going to su surpass modeling improvements in importance. In other words, you know, in the 1990s, I made my mark by improving the scalability of the atmospheric model. The next version of me is going to make the mark by improving the data analysis workflow of the model, not by tweaking the scalability of the of the, of the. It's not to say that there is no importance to improving the models. It's just that they're they're not going to be as important in terms of improving the sciences. So there's all your bits going in the uh, Big data frontiers. We're looking at parallel workflow environments. There's a thing called SWIFT, parallel analysis tools. I'll show you some results we've gotten off our MPI. We have a tool which has been serial for many years. It's called the NCAR command language. That's being parallelized now so that we can do parallel uh, visualization and data analysis. And um, I think eventually we're moving to in situ computer analysis, supercomputer analysis. By that I mean we're not going to write it on the disk. We're going to perform a first level pass of analysis before it's ever even comes off the super itself. It's going to be, that's what I mean by in situ. Optimizing the analysis architectures. I've mentioned a couple of these already. I'll give a little bit more in a minute. But uh, another issue that we're going to have to deal with is a lot of these parallel data analysis activities look starting to look like map to use type activities. We need a kind of physical science oriented map reduce cluster. This is a cost issue too. It's like, can you build an architecture with a map reduced cluster that's cheaper than a central file system like we built? That's maybe one place where we have to refine our design. Algorithms. Uh, this is probably 80% of the audience that lives in this space, from what I can tell from the pizza conversations. But the, the whole notion of improving the algorithms by which we get information has Find information in these haystacks is, is very important. Um, we are looking at, data, at velocity data compression and climate data, which is, used to be unheard of. I mean, it would be, you know, like violating some religious canon or something. But people are starting to look at that, and we've had some pretty good results in compressing climate data by factors of four to eight, depending on the field, and taking that data uncompressing it and having it be statistically similar to the ensemble it came from. So that's a fairly confidence-building test. And the last thing is people. I mean, one of the main motivations of why I'm out talking about these things is, is that we desperately need people to select careers in this field and get involved in collaborating with us on the people side. So, you know, I'll just show you that we've done some of these things of, of taking that near-death experience type analysis, for lack of a better term, parallelizing that and speeding it up by more like 20-fold instead of 6 by by putting some reshuffling software together. So we've done a few things like that. In-situ analysis is changing how we do the models, adding an I.O. instead of pooping out a history file every month or so with all the variables in it, we can actually put an I.O. module in the code and put out each field independently as a time series buffered asynchronously from the model instead of having each component write out this sort of history file. Then 
that implies some things about memory on the supercomputer that we have to figure out. And then I think that I will jump over now the parallelization of the in-card command language. Just say that if you go and Google MCL, you will find that we have built a lot of customized tools for visualizing and analyzing uh, data sets and all that stuff is, is the parallelization. This is one of the compression results. This is right is real, left is Memorex. Uh, the difference is here, the t-test is there. Uh, again, the, the Pepsi test with this stuff, and I, I have, uh, we're looking at different algorithms and stuff, but the Pepsi test I want is to, is to do a compression, uncompress it, put it in an ensemble and dare somebody find which one of the ensemble I, I compress. So that's that's kind of what you have to do to convince people. Now, this is my sort of dream slide. What if we can make this stuff as fast as we could? So we, we took this problem, which is looking for heat waves. And so it's a fairly simple problem. You look and say, find place, you know, find points on the earth where in the data set, it was hotter than 40 degrees centigrade, let's say, or something like that, for three days in a row for the high temperature. If that is, then declare that a heat wave. You know, it's a fairly simple concept. The problem with, the, with this sort of stuff is when you start saying, well, what's the spatial extent of that? What's the temporal extent of that? And you have kind of a blob of space time that you're trying to find. So we, uh, we put together a little project with RMPI in which, uh, just generically, we have some observing stations with temperatures. We, we do a creaking step to infer a field for that statistically. We do that for all the different time levels. And then uh, each process is working on a set of times so we chop up the times history of that field that way. And then we look at the transpose of that and do the space decomposition in all time. And then we try to do the part of building a spatial temporal field for this. So that's a kind of scan through, through all those records. If you look at that kind of thing, this is the RNPI results. It's basically perfect scaling. We turn an hour long job each. Okay, so in this experiment, you had a thousand of tasks like this. You gave 100 processors, 10 of them. One of them takes 5.2 seconds. If you divide them up with 10 workers, or 10 jobs per worker, you get roughly 52 seconds. There is some unevenness in some of these if you look at. If you look over here, some of these creaking results take longer than other ones. So it's not exactly perfect, but it's pretty good. So we can cut an hour job down to a minute, basically. Just say that. So this is this is very encouraging. It says to me that a lot of people use R. I'm, Imagine some of you are familiar with the fact there's RMPI. It means that we could build tools on that where it would allow the statistics community to get involved in, in building some of these kind of searches for us. Now, collecting heat waves is great. The thing that makes it look like it reduces is most of the time we just want to get some sort of reduced histogram or something. This happens to be a histogram that Hansen published that actually shows the historical record in the U.S. shifting from 59 to 69, comparing it to 2001-2011. This shift is climate change. That's his contention there. But that's uh, just generically, you know, all this data, we wanted to distill it down into a plot like that. It's kind of embarrassing. Top 10 storms is another example of, let's, you know, another search beside heat waves would be, show me the, you know, in, in some climate model, 
the 10 most severe precipitation events in the model, or track all the hurricanes that happen in the simulation, or show me when a pineapple express occurs. A pineapple express is like a ton of moisture. This is that uh, carries like a conveyor belt and carries moisture into Southern California, for example. You will get extreme flooding events. In the early 1900s, the Sony Valley turned into a lake because of a month-long pineapple express. These are very important events to find, but this is some kind of medical tomography. That's like find a pine pineapple express seems to me to be like find a tumor or something. It's a, it's a spatial structure that has some particular characteristic that is precisely defined. Same thing for convective systems, you know. Find some storm that looks like a comet. Find one of these big comets in the model. What is that? So the last thing I want to talk about is, is people. So we have an internship program that is designed to bring students in. in I would say I originally brought, wanted to bring in people to work on a parallel model. Most of the people coming in now are working in one way or another on our analysis and statistics side of the equation. Not all of them, but it's definitely And we're, um, we're in the habit of doing data analysis training sessions where we come for a week and we train people how to use our tools, we're going to have to par parallelize the training a little bit. But I just wanted to touch on the fact that you can't do any of this stuff without getting people involved. And then I think one of the things from the architecture point of view is just we have to take a look at whether we can do a map reduced type architecture and do these kind of searches cheaper than on a supercomputer. We can prototype benchmarks on a supercomputer and then benchmark different architectures and get set. But we have to have these searches coded up in order to actually do a realistic comparison. So one thing I'd like to do is try and do some you know, cheap local disk type cluster as opposed to the uh, and if you look at that, you could probably put our whole RDA on two racks of some of these hyper-dense clusters that are coming out. And then there's this NVRAM stuff. I'm really interested in that because it comes, it's sort of fatter than DRAM and not as fat as SSD, but it is um, closer. So it's a sort of on the order of the latency of regular memory, but much, much bigger. So I'm going to be able to do some cool things with that. That's just some <coughs> choices. Now that's uh, basically all I've got. i got a couple of them. Uh, HMC here. What I would call stack memory. If you do stack memory, you can get cheaper, higher density, uh, faster, lower power consumption. It's essentially one of the ways we might end up is having the processor sitting like a pat of butter on a stack of pancakes. But a stack of pancakes is a memory that seems to be it's making me hungry. <laughs> okay. So, with that in mind, I will. Turn it over for questions, and I'm, you know, it's, I know it's a long ride, but I basically tried to teach you the, the lay of the land in the entire field. It's impossible, but thank you for hanging. So going back to the hockey stick slide, yeah, yeah. Um, is it a concern, or do you think it's happening where your your observed data, I, I assume, would be more dense, like now, <coughs> more satellite data, yeah, more stations, things like that? Is it a con concern then that, that you're developing your model on possibly a different regime? 
Is that is, is there an effect there, or is that is that not a concern? Well, you know, I, I, one way to say it is, is that the, the older data that's by proxies, let's say, like lake sediments or tree rings or those sorts of things, those uh, and and again, we're looking at one observable, right, which is this temperature anomaly or the mean temperature or whatever you want to call it. Uh, that's not very well constrained back then. So you could look at it that way and say that the observations constrain much more tightly in the recent time than they do in the past, which suggests that you could fit a lot of different models that maybe did poorly in the past, but were tuned to behave quite well in the recent time. And so that's a that's a, a concern from the point of view that you know you would like to have a well constrained set of observations that were more uniform than that. So it is a I think it's an area of concern. And, and you know, people are always trying to get better observations. You know, there's a kind of industry of uh, you know data forensics of, of going back and I had a very interesting story told to me about this that, um, you know, they were trying to understand. So they used to make observations of sea temperature essentially by the Admiralty, British Admiralty, would have this standard bucket that they lowered into the ocean. Uh, and then they, they, I don't know exactly how it worked, but they filled it full of water at some depth, you know, and then they hauled it to the surface really quickly. And, measured the temperature. Well, this has a, all kinds of, you know, drive a person crazy now, you know, because, like, there's all, what the temperature can change while you're raising this, you know, some of these seamen might have been stronger than other ones, and, you know, God knows all the things. Uh, so they have all these records, so people actually built replicas of these buckets and did field experiments with these 19th century buckets. You know, I don't know if they dressed in period costumes, <laughs> but you know they did the whole reenacted this stuff and then tried to estimate, you know, do a better job of estimating. It. So um, people are trying to improve those constraints all the time. It's a that's a, it's a difficult one because, like I, I said, you know, climate. You know, Climate operates on multiple time scales. Some of them are hundreds of years. You know, the ocean turnover time is a thousand years. We don't have good ocean observations for a thousand years. So, I think uh, everybody is quite concerned about our knowledge of those processes. So, yeah, hopefully that and you know, answered it a little bit. Yeah, I just um, I guess maybe I. It seems it seems like um, you know that would be you know interesting to, to investigate that you know but I, of course I don't know anything about well you models. know I I have a colleague who was one of the reviewers on the you know the well the hockey stick is really funny to me because you know it's just one observable right there are hundreds of observables it's just that one has has garnered a lot of controversy around. I have a colleague who worked on sort of the uh, bedding of, of the construction of that, that whole thing, which is, it's a mashup of hundreds of data sets. It's an extremely complicated beast. And, uh, you, you, you know, so you have a lot of statistical uh, methods. Again, you know, the, the Bayesian statistical methods and things are trying to infer sort of how, what you actually know about these fields from this set of observations that trying to correlate that over hundreds of years. It's a very complicated problem. But if you wanted to talk to an expert in that, I could connect to this because I have a, a limit to my interest in knowledge. I did something, I guess. That's the help. Any other questions? Good question. Uh, yeah. Can you, can you come over here, please, so the people <coughs> watching at home can hear you? Thank you. If there's well, anybody who just switched to ESPN Sports Desk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the question would be, do you find any use in um, back projections? So would you ever um, do simulations of 
the middle middle ages perhaps or even to the bronze age or further further back uh, to find um, I don't know sort of historical weather events maybe that that would line up there. Is there any use of back Well people have simulated the so long as simulation I'm aware of and paleoclimatology is a whole other subject in a sense. So a lot of climate scientists obviously are interested in sort of the industrial age and climate change, and, you know, all that action. The paleoclimate community goes back and looks at all kinds of things in the deep past. Uh, I know of one simulation that's gone since the last, uh, it's 20,000 years since the last glacial maximum. It's tried to simulate the whole 20,000 year history of the earth at a fairly low resolution. You know, you have to have made compromises. You strip down the model to kind of to run as fast as possible, and then you run run those kind of experiments. And uh, so people do look at the medieval warm period, and uh, you know they try to study some of these things to understand. I think one thing that's kind of interesting is the awareness of climate events and in influencing human history is higher now. So historians are interested in getting climate information. You know, I guess the, there are theories about how. Uh, various collapses of empires, you know, sort of like what happened after. I don't know when they when they found a crater that, that caused the KT boundary and the dinosaur extinction. Paleontologists were just out looking for meteors to kill their animals too. It was like, you know, it's like I found a I found a hammer and nail. Let's drive that thing to them. <laughs> excuses for it. So, you know, that I think there's a similar thing like that, but it's an elevated awareness in the historical community. So, yeah, I think that that's a sub-community. Are there any uh, special scientific methods that you use to find causality? For example, if you have a year or two of uh, a heat wave or even a cooling period, um, what scientific methods do you use to find causality? It could be caused by a sunspot. It could be man-made influence. Well, this is called attribution. So, uh, at attribution is one of, one of the uh, subspecialties in climate science. And so, uh, that is an extremely difficult topic, one that I'm not really an expert in. I know enough to call it attribution. Uh, but you know, fundamentally, um, the the problem with this thing is, is that every time something bad happens, someone in the press wants to know was that you know did, was Sandy caused by climate change? And somebody said, well, you can't you know you can't say one thing was the result of some shift in the probability distribution. It's like if I roll stink eyes twice with paradise, is that being their load? No. Right? It's the same kind of issue. So it's a people have done do these kind of things, but they're very careful statistical analysis and analyses. Um, again, I can hook you up with somebody who's really more of an expert on that. But uh, it's a it really from my point of view, when people talk about data mining in our field, that generally means geostatistics. I haven't seen a lot of people with um, you know, what you would call computer science, science type heuristics going after this stuff. It's been mostly Bayesian, uh, hierarchical Bayesian statistical analysis type problem, problem solution techniques. But it's, uh, you know, the problem with attribution is we really don't have controls, right? You know, this, we have. The, the weak spot of climate science is it's a historical science in the sense we have one planet, we have what it did, and then everything else is simulations of that. There's no, you know, we don't have a control planet where we can really do experiments. So that's a that's an attribute of this fundamental attribute of science that has to be well, I know that right now there's a, a CPU parallel computing and the GPU. It seems like GPU is emerging. <coughs> and when these two guys talk together, it seems like 
we get faster computations and all that. Um, so my first question, does the new facility at the Wyoming have the GPU stuff? And uh, like, do, do you guys use it? And to what extent? Thank you. Yeah, we have uh, GPUs are confined to the data analysis sections of our computer. And we did not buy a uh, wholesale bunch of heterogeneous processors with like Intel and let's say NVIDIA processors or, or mics. We do have a small number of mics and a small number of GPUs in the system. And they're there for evaluation. Okay. And uh, I have a team that's been working on those kinds of benchmarks in track. <clears throat> trying to evaluate, you know, if you have a 1.3 million lines of code, this is not something you can port with, you know, a couple of red bulls. You know, it's <laughs> hack it, hack it. So <clears throat> we're really, we're really trying to figure out how we could develop a sensible code migration strategy and uh, figure out which parts of the code would yield the most benefits. I would say right now, though. Results are mixed on that. But we've been working on that, I'd say, about a year now. Yes. Um, I have a number of questions, so I hope you come to the sink afterwards. But uh, um, the part that was uh, uh, intriguing to me, or one of the parts that was really intriguing to me, is when you talked about this this sort of dream or vision of being able to sort of make Google type queries into your system. Right. And uh, what I was trying to wrap my head around was what exactly you'll be providing if such a service existed in the sense that you have all of this data um, uh, of observations. And, uh, and if somebody wants to know about heat waves, for example, there might be hundreds of different data sets that contribute to your understanding of whether or not there was a heat wave and some might contradict others. So in that sort of scenario, um, you're presenting back to the query a sort of distilled result saying that, well, based on all of this consolidation of different data sets, we believe there was a heat wave of this magnitude in this period. And similarly, when you're talking about maybe a query that, that might ask about, say, some future prediction or model prediction, um, is, does that then imply that the system would have one master model that is essentially um, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't. I didn't quite understand whether, when we were talking about all these models, whether there's just one model, or whether NCAR maintains hundreds of different models that uh, uh, apply to different subsets of the data. And so, what would be returned by a query that was asking about hey, when when is surface uh, or sea level going to reach, you know, say two inches higher than what it is yesterday? Well, I think that. Uh, what I'm what I'm trying to well, well this is a lot of key pieces in that question. So we don't have hundreds of models, but we don't have one model either. You know, so let's let's say that we have, um, you know, people have variants and, and uh, they choose to run models with different configurations. So you know, let's say we have a couple dozen different possible modeling sources. And then I told you, we have 600 data sets right, in the RDA alone. So really, what I'm talking about is a, a parallel, you know, if I were to articulate it, would be something like this. I want a, a parallel problem-solving environment that allows me to import data sets that I select and build queries relatively easily that allow me to search through um, spatial and temporal data sets um, and, and pull features out that I want to look at. Like I want to tape off just the heat wave incidents in this, in this particular data set. I, I'm not talking about some kind of master query thing. I'm talking about Every scientist is going to want to ask a different question. I want a framework where the scientist can quickly craft that, maybe from a set of examples that have been built up by an ecosystem, you know, adapt. You know, that's what everybody does, like with make files. You know, I don't know, you got 
I never know if I'm talking to people who know what I mean. Well, but the point is, you know, like Abraham wrote a make file back in, you know, in, in Israel in 500 years ago. And people have been hacking that as the grad students passed it down ever since. So we want that kind of ecosystem. Mark can ask these questions without having to sort of write something. Right now, I mean, what people do is they go to the thing and they download terabytes of stuff on their home system and they run a serial query that they've written in Fortran or uh, you know, whatever. Uh, and they're doing this all very slowly and I want to speed that up. But you know, it's just too diverse of a community of with different interests to write anything that looks like a master query. But, so, you know, that's my, you know, if I had a dream that looks like that. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm curious about the constraints. You talked about you built your system and you were really happy with it, but now you wish your terabytes per teraflops right. was 60 instead of 10. If, are you, which if you had infinite resources, well, not infinite resources, but if you had a fair amount of resources, could your, could your file system deal with pushing it to 60, or are there other constraints in the system that kind of prevent you from pushing that? File? Yeah. Um, well, I think 60 is based on a couple of things. New technologies that are coming along, uh, the recognition that this stuff is going to become more and more of a constraint. And uh, it's a zero-sum game that really boils down to dollars. I mean, you know, we'll go out to buy a machine, we have so many millions of dollars, and we have to decide, you know, in the architecture, how much is going to go for data stuff and how much is going to go for supercomputing. So part of that is reassessing that balance again. And then the second piece is reassessing what the architecture looks like. I'm starting to think that we need to look at an analysis cluster that looks more like a, you know, distributed, you know, an embedded disk, MapReduce-like architecture, with really sort of going for the price performance number for that step. You know, I mean, our machines really tuned to solve partial differential equations. It's not clear to me that. That's the balance that you need for solving these queries that we have happen. So, you know, that's why I think the, that's why I call it co evolution. You know, we have to kind of push the architecture and we have to push the software and the scientific culture towards the most cost effective way to do these analyses. You know, it's, it's sort of a shot in the dark in answering your question. So, so will the push toward MapReduce and parallel algorithms lower that target down from 60 to other supercomputers? Well, that's an interesting, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't really know because I, I don't think I will know anything sensible about that until I have some of these codes as benchmarks and can run them on different architectures. I mean, I just, we have the heat wave example more or less in a place where I, I could imagine benchmarking that on a MapReduce cluster. Like, you know, when I was at supercomputing last fall, Dell had these really cheap ARM-based um, clusters with SATA drives in them. And really, uh, not very impressive when you come to it as an HPC guy used to building PDE solvers, but I don't know if you looked at the dollar numbers, that might be the way to go. In which case, do you, you know, does that change the balance of things? It depends on what numbers you get out. Would there ever be uh, an interest on Agatha's part when you're talking about the um, the query, sort of querying the system for data? Would there be 
and, and the idea of bring your own data, um, the idea of sort of user contributed data, would there ever be an interest in having it um, open up the simulation models frameworks to uh, somebody, say like myself, who would be interested in doing weather, who might uh, like to do some simulations on the cluster, but in really in no way associated with NCAR, sort of a bring your own model, open source interaction type deal with NCAR? Well, all the data that I've, well, first of all, all the data sets that I've described, so the CMIP 5 data that, that's been run, uh, the research data archive, all of that stuff is freely available. So you can go and sign up. I don't recommend downloading it all. Uh, but, you know, it's available and you can experiment with things. As far as getting time on the computer, if you uh, have an NSF grant, you can get a small allocation to do things, experiment with things. So it's, a, it's an open system in the sense that it's meant to support the scientific So you can, you know, potentially work on it. Now, if you want to do something gigantic, well, you have to justify that as, as you mentioned, all resources and the right to do. Uh, I guess I'm thinking sort of in the uh, the hacking community. Kind of, uh, <laughs> not so really. You mean hacking as a Anonymous? No, 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 no. As in the uh, 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 people who don't have NSF grants, but think it might be fun. Not so much. Well, you know, we have what are called startup grants, which are meant for, like, let's say, a graduate student or something like that who doesn't really have a grant or a track record, but is going to presumably use the resources to develop a grant. But in general, at the end of the day, we expect you to you know, get a grant and do your research and then just play around. But that the startup grants are designed to, you know, develop a more serious proposal. There, you know, it's no different than any other like NSF resource. The same kind of thing. You can get a startup account for at least to use some resources. This hosting uh, first system grid is it Encar or, or someone else? Oh, uh, first, well, the Earth system grid is hosted uh, on a number. There are a number of so-called uh, host sites. There's a place called TCMPI. That what I found is, I'm sorry, but uh, some of the uh, data sets are not uh, downloadable for some reason, and. Uh, even though when you go and, and uh, read FAQ, um, I do exactly the same what they're saying there, but I still can't download that. Well, it's a joint. <laughs> so whatever bad behavior it has, I'm not responsible. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's a system that you can report problems to. There, are, I guess my point is that the data is, is a distributed or federated by system, right? So there are multiple sites that own parts of the data and it's presented to you as a federated set of things. So if one of those members of that federation is down or not communicating properly, you might have you might experience some kind of problem. That's one of the one of the things they try to do with that. It's so big that you, you can't really put it all in one place. You have to just sort of try to glue it together virtually. That's what they Yes. You spoke about uh, your 1.2 million lines of code, and this is a tremendous asset. What type of what type of governance and software engineering uh, do you have wrapped around such an incredible asset? Well, it's. Uh, and what is it written? In? <laughs> uh, well, uh, it's written. In, it's mostly written in Fortran. Okay. Uh, there are some parts of it. Uh, some of the libraries and customized pieces that are, that are written in more modern languages, you got to say it that way. Uh, there is uh, a governance mechanism <coughs> which is very robust. There's a, basically it's organized around working groups, and so the working groups are generally associated with each of these models that are the sub-components of it, so there's an atmospheric working group, an ocean working group, an ice C 
sea ice work, land surface work. And there's a scientific steering committee, which, and a PI at the top of that, that make the decisions when somebody comes in and says, I have two different competing parameterizations for the same thing, and look at the look at the results and pick which one gets in the model. So it's a they have an annual meeting, they have training built around and all the things. So it's a very very large and uh, robust governance. The software engineering core team is an NCAR. The what's called the Software Engineering Working Group, and the, the, uh, the CEO of Sam Software Engineering Group is, in, is located in cars, probably an order of a dozen people. It doesn't have TVs, maybe 15 people or something, because some of them are part-time with it. And those people work on the project, but by no means are they the only people writing software. They, you know, and they have standards uh, in terms of like uh, manual style. Like, you know, there's a uh, accession process. It's all in the repository. It has branches and all that kind of modern stuff. So it's um, it's pretty robust, actually. It's a, it's been a lot of people have looked at it as a model of how to get like, a large community to collaborate on something bigger than. You know, if you look 30 years ago, it was like a, you know, the model was Don, the Don Quixote model. You know, the professor and his former grad student, Sancho Panza, being the grad student and Don Quixote being the advisor. And that was, they were building their model or they were trying to work with the model. And, and that's just subcritical. You can't do this level of complexity. So that's why I'm doing this. So, uh, I mean, you have like a classic big data problem. And I was wondering, are you looking? Obviously, the movement of data is going to kill you, right, eventually. If, as you move, as people have to move more and more data around in a federated data distributed model, that's the thing that's going to kill you in the end is to move these big piles of data around so they can do analysis on them. So, have you actually looked at a graph? Of, like what percent of your computing is being spent just moving data around versus actually doing analytical work on the data? And People, have, well, in that federated data system, I, mean, I don't have the statistics in a plot, but people have looked at what fraction of the data is getting moved around uh, between the, the nodes of the federated facility. People in general are uh, you know, scrambling to put in functions to subset data and, and otherwise minimize how much data gets downloaded. So, so putting these server-side utilities on there are, is a very high priority. But in terms of looking at, well, one thing I can say, you know, I showed you know I showed those RDA numbers, and, and you know. A couple of years ago, people were always showing, like, look at how much more data people are requesting. Isn't that a good thing? And now it's not necessarily viewed as a good thing, right? I mean, we, we really need to have be serving more and more users, but leveling off or slowing down the rate of increase of that time. So this is why server side stuff is so because So are you caching data then on the? In some of these systems, yes. And what they about have the data caching mechanisms? But not all of these systems, I don't believe, are have sophisticated data caching mechanisms. And what about, have you thought about like, using like a Splunk like system right, where data is actually indexed as it's pouring into the system to make it easier to pull it back out later? No, I'm not aware of it. Thank you. All right. I guess we'll go and you want me to bring up yours? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.
It reminds me of a story. There's a guy in San Diego, and he's walking along the beach, and uh, he sees this bottle in the sand. And he goes over and he picks up the bottle, and it's really old. And uh, he says, wow, this looks like it's an antique. And he rubs it, and all of a sudden, smoke comes out of it, and a beautiful female genie comes out. And the genie says, wow, congratulations. You have won one free wish. The only thing is, is that you have to let me get back into my bottle, and you need to bury me two feet under the, the sand on the beach. He says, deal. She goes, okay, what's your wish? And he says, well, you know, I've always wanted to visit Hawaii, but I'm terrified of flying, and I get seasick. I can't go by the ocean, so what I want you to do is build me a bridge from the mainland, United States, to Hawaii. The genie scratches her head and looks at her <coughs> and says, you know, that's really difficult. I mean, you're talking about a long distance. That's a long way from the United States to Hawaii. You're talking about a lot of concrete. It's going to be a real architectural and building challenge to put all that concrete and fasten it to the bottom of the ocean. The genie looks at him and says, I don't think I can grant you that wish. Think of another wish. So he goes, well, okay, you know, I have a PhD in statistics. And I've been hearing all this buzz about data science and data scientists, and I'd like to get a piece of this. I've been working with data my entire life, and I think that I can do this. So my wish is I want you to tell me what data science is and what the heck do data scientists do? Bacini looks at him. This is you want two lanes or four lanes. <laughs> <laughs> so what is data science? I think data science is a new field, and it um, really just means the scientific study of the creation, manipulation, and transformation of data to create meaning. And the key thing here is it's a scientific study, and that's what makes it different. So a lot of people ask me, well, what's the difference between data science and traditional business intelligence, or BI, or big data? And the basic way to explain it is that business intelligence is about what happened in the past. It basically has to do with internal data that an organization creates and structured data. Data science, or big data, has to do with both internal data and external data, a lot of external data sources, has to do with both structured data and unstructured data, and really has to do with the future, what you can predict, uh, and how you deal with outcomes from point A to point B, where your organization is now, and where you want your organization to go. There are different types of data analysis, and I think this explains it uh, simply. Uh, business intelligence has to do with the past, uh, and a lot of the BI <coughs> tools that you see today, it's basically just going to describe what happened in the past. There's also operational analytics, has to do with monitoring your operations uh, and finding out better ways to uh, run your business processes. Then you get into type two and one, which are really where the data scientist lies. And that is using math, advanced statistics, different scientific methods, machine learning, algorithms to do your work. So whenever I go to see a new prospective client, they always spend 10 or 15 minutes complaining about their business intelligence program. They always tell me, you know, we spent millions of dollars on this data warehouse, on this BI program, and we're getting almost no return on investment. It's basically telling me things I already know. I can't get my employees to use it. I don't even know how to use it right. 
And I listen to them and I smile and I say, well, the solution is data science. What you need to do is you need to move beyond basic business intelligence. So I show them this. And I say, here's where basic business intelligence is. Basically what happened in the past. This is where you need to go. You need to go to predictive analytics. You need to go to forecasting. You need to go to optimization. And this is the holy grail. Nine out of ten times, their eyes get real big. All of a sudden, their facial expression changes. They become more positive. And I know right there, I close the deal. The rest of the details are going to be important. So there are three basic types of analytics. Descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. Again, descriptive is your basic data warehouse, business intelligence, legacy system. Predictive is forecasting. And then prescriptive, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is optimization and simulation. And prescriptive is really the holy grail. That's where all organizations are shooting for. So what are some of the uses? Uh, the benefits of data science. Well, discovering what we don't know from data. For example, uh, many truck and bus companies are fitting their engines and their tires with sensors that record in real time what's happening. So if something is starting to go wrong with their engine, they're going to learn it right away. Um, and they're going to not have to wait for scheduled maintenance. And this is causing a much more efficient um, truck and bus service. Obtaining predictive, actionable insight. Well, we can see the color blue <coughs> trending so that uh, people are buying more blue laptops and therefore we need to start producing more blue laptops. Creating data products with a business impact. For example, Coca-Cola has an incredible algorithm that has a formula for its secret syrup and it's called uh, the Black Book. And it has hundreds of different variables. And it can tell you, a big part of it are oranges. So they have variables about the weather patterns and how they affect oranges. Um, and uh, this is an example of a data product, designing and executing an algorithm. So communicating relevant uh, business stories. Uh, for example, I don't know if any of you are Bronco fans, but our uh, star outside linebacker uh, is probably going to be suspended for four games for doing drugs. Well, they knew about this. He already been caught for doing drugs and put into a rehab program. So as an organization, you understand, OK, we've got a guy here who does drugs. We're going to try and help him. But we're going to need to possibly get a replacement for him in case this becomes a problem. And it eventually did. So you have to have stories, and you have to be able to uh, plan certain future events. Better decision making. Uh, this can be in uh, healthcare, for example. If doctors have uh, different data sources, uh, sensors that monitor my cholesterol rate, my heart rate, my blood sugar rate, um, adding business value. Data science can add business value in just about anything. McKinsey did a huge study and basically found that 85% of organizations value data science and big data to make better decisions. They want to become a more data-driven organization. And I do believe that this is true, because when I sit and I talk with business leaders or public policy leaders, they all say this. But what oftentimes when we start to do the real work uh, and we present the results of data science to them, Oftentimes, they find it very difficult to change. They find it very difficult to accept that we're recommending that they do things a different way because they get very committed to doing things one way. Uh, a very brief example is, do any of you recognize uh, the story of Dr. Summerwise in the mid-1800s? He was a physician in uh, Vienna, Austria. And he saw in the hospital that uh, many newborn babies were dying. And nobody understood why. And he had a theory, and he tested it out, uh, that a lot of the doctors were getting germs on their hands, going to the morgues <coughs> and other places. And he suggested that doctors simply wash their hands 
was so and some chlorine solution. And he did some selected tests on this, just like a data scientist would, and found that this cut the infant mortality rate down to, I think it was something like 20 to 30 percent, down to less than 1 percent. So here was strong evidence that this worked. But the medical establishment had a different theory. They believed, I think, in the four humors. And Semmelweis was basically introducing a new theory called germ theory. But it wasn't confirmed as a scientific theory at that point. And I don't think it was until 20 years later that Pasteur actually introduced the germ theory. But the medical establishment rejected Semmelweis. And they basically fired him from his post as a doctor in the hospital and banished him. He had, I think, go to Hungary. And uh, it's just, and he was right though. Summer Weiss was right. And these doctors just could not <coughs> change because their paradigm, well, I see a lot of this in real life. So when you're working with businesses, sometimes uh, they say they want to be more data driven, but when you give them very strong evidence that a process that they're using or a strategy that they're using may not be optimal, and perhaps they should try this, you often get a lot of resistance. Um, what is a data scientist? Well, basically, I say a data scientist is a professional who uses scientific methods, scientific methods to liberate and create meaning from raw data. And again, the key word is scientific methods. You know, you're not just um, uh, uh, playing around with data and seeing different relationships and seeing correlations and uh, saying, well, I think this correlation may say this, that, or the other thing, you really do have to use scientific methods. There are cases where strong correlations can be used, for example, in sales and marketing, but in many hard sciences or in law or in healthcare, you really can't do that. You really do need to find causality because if you're wrong, the consequences are too great. So what does a data scientist do? Well. A data scientist uses a lot of different skills, math, statistics, <coughs> hacking, um, uh, creating uh, algorithms, machine learning. But I can tell you working with a lot of data scientists, it's not the technical skills that separates out the really, really good, the fantastic data scientists from the merely good data scientists. What really separates it is creativity, a sense of wonder. A great data scientist is going to be asking a lot of what if questions. Um, have a, a, a sense of being skeptical about a lot of things. Uh, a sense of wonder, introducing, trying new things, running a lot of random controlled experiments, not having any limits. Um, that's really the key. Uh, this is an excellent graph about all the different techniques that data scientists use. Um, and I'm going to suggest that while data scientists need to know a little bit about every one of these things, the best bet of a data scientist is to pick one or two and to specialize in it. It's like a profession like law or medicine. You wouldn't expect your uh, heart surgeon to be able to treat your uh, bad knee. You wouldn't expect a patent lawyer to be able to represent you in court on a contract case. This is just as difficult, just as highly specialized as anything in law or medicine, and you should really pick one or two to specialize in. So data engineers, all right. What do data engineers do? Very simply, they design, build, and manage the big data infrastructure. And data engineers, are the data scientist's best friend. Your best friend is a data engineer. You want to treat these people right. You want to take them to lunch. You want to give them whatever they need. On the other hand, the best friend of a good data engineer is a data scientist. So you need to work as a team. What do data engineers do? Well, they basically work with the whole information management system of an organization. It could be a scientific organization like NCAR. It could be the United States government, an agency in the United States government. It could be an agency in the state of Colorado. It could be a business the size of Exxon. It could be a small business um, uh, that maybe has two, three hundred people. Um, 
and a good data engineer knows a little about all these things, but they run the infrastructure. The data scientist does not run the infrastructure. A good data engineer is going to be able to architect the right type of infrastructure for each organization or each um, part of an organization. There are hundreds of different ways to architect uh, big data ecosystems. And a good data engineer will work with the data scientists and the leaders of an organization to architect the right type. The most important thing I think that a data engineer needs to do is to be able to make simple data. That means being able to get the right data at the right time to people who need that data. And that includes the data scientists. I can't tell you how many times I go into an organization and I find that the people who need data to do analysis have to wait not only hours, but days, weeks, sometimes months, because they don't have the right architecture. I see so many times data scientists wasting so much time just trying to find the right data, cleaning up that data. That's a waste of time. This needs to be planned out with a really sound information management strategy and the right architecture. So a good data engineer is going to create simple data. Why is all this important? Well, the amount of data is exploding, and we're going to need new technologies and new methods to um, handle all this data. Um, you can see here it's rising exponentially. A lot of it unstructured data. Um, I think in the last two years has produced 90% of the world's data. And if we don't get the architecture right, it's just going to get worse and worse. Once the Internet of Things comes online, it's going to explode into a new ballgame altogether. The only thing that's holding this back, the Internet of Things means we're going to put sensors in everything, including our human bodies, and it's going to produce a whole lot of data that has never been produced before. The thing that's holding it back is that we don't have a standard protocol for the sensors to talk to one another. Once we figure that out, it's going to explode it. It's going to create so much work for data scientists and data engineers. So here's the key thing I want you to take away. The only thing that you need to remember about my talk tonight is that data science <coughs> is a team sport. It's not uh, a lone ranger type of deal. And this is something data scientists need to learn because even myself, I really like at times to shut the world out and I have to work alone. Concentrate for six, seven hours at a clip on really abstract, difficult problems. But you also need to be able to communicate and share that with your team, especially the data engineers. This is something that Gardner put out um, uh, last year, and it's pretty good. Uh, on our data science teams, we uh, put together uh, what's called business architects, along with data scientists and the data engineers. And they basically are the communicators. They're often the team leaders that communicate with the leaders of the business saying, here are the most important challenges. This is what we need to do. Um, and then communicate with the data scientists and make sure that they understand they're all on the same page trying to solve the same problems. Data architects, these are programmers, basically, who can deal with a lot of messy data sets. Um, they're very, very important. Um, data architects, again, are a data scientist's best friend. You've got to treat them really, really well. Data visualizers. Every data scientist should learn how to create good visualizations. What I mean by good, it means others, lay people, can look at it and understand it very easily and intuitively. If we can't make, we can't communicate to lay people, we fail. It doesn't matter how good our work is. If we don't communicate it to decision makers, that makes a different in the or difference in the organization. We fail. That's the bottom line. So a good data visualizer that specializes in that is vital to have on a team. Data change agents. This basically means how organizations use data within the own or their own organization um, to change their business and knowledge processes internally. So what is the difference between the regular uh, data warehouse architecture and the new big data architecture? Very simply, the traditional legacy data warehouse 
business intelligence structure only deals with structured data and internal data. The new big data, data analytical ecosystem, whatever you want to call it, deals with unstructured data, structured data, internal data, external data. Now, you can't very well throw out the traditional data warehouse. Organizations have spent millions of dollars on it. So what you have to do is you have to build ecosystems around it and then integrate it in. And I can tell you, we do a lot of this work. It's very, very challenging. You're going to be dealing with structured data, unstructured data, sensor data, new data types, volume, velocity, variability, and I would include veracity, data quality is something we're going to need to deal with better in the future. Data scientists and data engineers need to work together as a team to figure this out. Now, Hadoop is really changing the game here because you see how much cheaper it is to run an open source Hadoop system compared to your traditional database. The downside is Hadoop is very difficult to run. And there are only a few specialized experts with the expertise and experience to actually run Hadoop. But it's so much cheaper, it's worth it. So organizations are just putting in Hadoop systems before they have enough people who really know what, the, what they're doing to run them. And they're just dumping data into them. It's a new word. I think it's going to, we're going to introduce it to the dictionary. It's called the dump. Just dump everything into your Hadoop and figure out what you're going to do with it later. <laughs> By the way, it'll get easier. Um, the scientific method, I can't tell you how important this is, and this is what distinguishes data scientists from others, is that you got to ask a question. I always tell people, you know, exploratory data science is wonderful, but you really need to start with a business challenge, a question. What are you trying to solve? Narrow it down. Um, and then create an hypothesis. Test it by doing experiments, preferably randomly controlled experiments. Analyze it, draw a conclusion, and then a report. And I can tell you, data scientists spend most of their time doing experiments. And also in data science, we're moving away from model land because all models are flawed. Some are useful in terms of being able to understand things. The problem is we found out in finance, and we're finding this out in the hard sciences as well, is that models too often create a false sense of reality, an illusion. And if you start to make decisions as an organization based on flawed models, thinking that it represents reality, eventually those bad decisions add up and you get something like the financial blow up, meaning it had to do with the, the principal cause of the financial uh, blow up was something called uh, VAR, um, value at risk. These models were terribly flawed and they led to a false sense of security in terms of the risks all these uh, big financial houses were taking in these mortgage backed securities. Um, so we have to be very careful of models. I'm a believer of models. I use models, but I don't over rely on them. And I realize, my gosh, this is not reality. It's simply a model. Instead, we're moving towards more randomly controlled experiments, doing tons of experiments. And as you get faster computers, you can do more and more experiments. So this is uh, the data science formula that we use. Uh, everybody has their own formula. You can take this, you can tweak it, but the basic fundamentals are the same. I would suggest that you do the same as you find something that you feel comfortable with and create a checklist. Make sure that you go through it. Um, correlation versus causation. Everybody's heard of this, but this is an example of a correlation that, of course, there's no causation. There's no, you know, between murders in the U.S. and the Internet Explorer market share. But as you deal with larger and larger data sets, you're going to find more and more correlations like this. And some of them you're going to think, oh my gosh, look, I found this. There's a correlation between this and this. And you're going to go to your client or your employer and tell them about this. And they're going to make terrible decisions. So you really, really need to be careful uh, about this. Um, finance and retail are the two biggest that uh, uh, are using data science right now. But it, it's got all sorts of different domains. 
uh, marketing, human resources, government, energy. Uh, it's predicting market trends. It's predicting customer offers for different segments, uh, demand, hiring the right people, managing risk. There's all sorts of things that uh, data science is going to help with. Fraud detection, uh, cross-selling, portfolio design. So the biggest thing in data science right now is predictive analytics. We're doing a ton of predictive analytics. And uh, I'm going to tell you very honestly, predictive analytics is very difficult to do. Very, and you're using Bayesian probability. So you have to be very careful about looking at your quality of evidence and explaining to your employer or your client that, look, you know, this is what we think, but really you, know, you have a 60 or 70 percent chance. It's similar to playing poker. You're trying to play your best hand. Um, you're trying to play the odds. But to do predictive analytics very well, very, very difficult. And I'm going to predict there are a lot of people who are claiming they're a data scientist, and they're mean, well-meaning. Uh, really don't understand how difficult it is, and they're going to be a bit more confident, and that people are going to rely on them, and they're going to make bad decisions, and there's going to be a backlash. Anyway, what will happen, what's going to happen, is very, very valuable to organizations. Uh, I'm going to skip over the techniques because we're running out of time. Um, this is the holy grail, prescriptive analytics, which basically goes beyond predictive in that once you can predict certain things by certain odds, you have to formulate plans to go from point A to point B. Well, there are many different ways. You know, there, there, there are many ways to skin a cat. What you want to do is, given the constraints of resources, what's the best way that your organization can go from here to here? And data science can really help uh, organizations run simulations, do experiments, um, use prescriptive analytics to find the best way to achieve your goals. This is the holy grail. So this is the way I explain it. Pe companies that rely just on basic business intelligence aren't going to last. They won't be able to compete. Simple as that. Companies that engage in predictive analytics will be competitive. They'll be around, okay? They may make a bunch of mistakes, they'll eventually get it right because they understand what will happen next, where the trends has much greater value than what happened in the past. But the companies will be leaders. They're using prescriptive analytics. Those are gonna be the companies that win the Super Bowls, that win the World Series. <coughs> so ethics, um, there are a lot of ethical uh, considerations. I'm going to skip over that today because we don't have time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting. I, um, you see data science. This is a, a Gartner hype cycle. I don't know how many of you people have seen this. Um, the data scientists they're putting over there going up, it's probably this year closer to the top. Uh, but on the other hand, here's a conflict. A lot of what we do is predictive analytics, which they put as mature, or, or social media. I mean, a lot of data scientists are in the social advertising space. Um, but the other insight I get, get from this is that I actually, and I have no proof of this, this is just my own theory. Data science is actually ahead of the data engineers. Look at all these different things that are about to go into the, the, the bad zone. Um, we're ahead of the technology. What we need is better technology. I predict it's coming in the next three to six years. But you're going to find that uh, a lot of the things that you want to do as data scientists, you'll be constricted by the technology. But again, you still need to make friends with those data engineers. So this is an interesting stat. Uh, in, uh, the uh, uh, big data um, spending, about half in services, half in hardware. That's my firm does systems integration, and that's what the services are. You need people to put all this stuff together. So here is the forecast, um, and you can see that from this year to next year, spending is going to double. 
So this is a field that is growing because it does. It adds incredible value. And it's going to keep on going up exponentially, and then even out as the technology gets better and gets cheaper. So where are all these data scientists going to come from? Uh, well, um, I think it was IDC and EMC did a, a, a study, and only 12% said that they thought that they would come from uh, today's business intelligence professionals. Um, and I think McKinsey did a study that said we're going to need in the next couple of years 190,000 new data scientists. Uh, so where are they going to come from? Well, the universities are going to have to produce them. People are going to have, you're going to have to teach yourself uh, largely. You know, New York University, Columbia University, Stanford, uh, University of California, Berkeley, they all have new data science programs. Hopefully, uh, I'm working with the University of Colorado. We are going to create uh, a data science program here at the university as well. But also, sometimes, uh, you, know, you, don't, you can be a high school dropout, and you can be a fantastic data scientist. In fact, you may even have an advantage because your mind doesn't get polluted <laughs> by all the educational stuff. And you can teach yourself all this stuff, but it takes a lot of discipline and brain power. Okay? So I think anybody can be a data scientist. But it does help that you have structured programs. So here in the last year, the uh, job trends, uh, 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 the uh, uh, search for data scientists, open jobs for data scientists have just gone through the roof. I predict, again, it's going to continue that way for the next few years. I just want to um, talk about a book I highly recommend to you. It's called Tribal Leadership. And it talks about the five stages of um, tribal uh, development. Stage one is a bunch of people like in gangs, life sucks. We, we don't know too many people who are stuck in stage one. Stage two is filled with people who just don't like their jobs, really don't like their life, but you know they can provide value. We all know people like this. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to have a member like this on your team. Stage three is where most teams are today. You know, a bunch of really smart lone warriors who really work hard, they want to do well, but they don't really interact well as a team. And you can do fairly well at stage three. You can be competitive, but you're not going to win anything great. You, you may make the playoffs, but you don't lose in the first round of the playoffs. You're not going to be in that leadership. So stage four is basically when a bunch of individuals say, we are the team. I'm going to give myself up to the goals of the team. And you start operating as a team. I spend most of my work trying to get teams to move from stage three to stage four. Once you can do that and get them to stage four, incredible things start to happen. Incredible things start to happen. And it's the same in data science. Data scientists and data engineers are teams. They need to work together. They can't be separate. You'll get away with it for a little while, but eventually firms that are operating as a team, you know, are going to outperform those that work individually. And then very, very rarely will you see a team get to stage five. And that's characterized by life is great. We're working as a team. Yes, I have an incredible ego and I can bring so much to the team, but I will, I will kill for you. I'm going to put my life on the line for my team. You know, uh, that's what you know. I have a, we have a sense of wonder. We can do anything. We're going to change the world. Very rarely, if you can get a team that, that's in there, you win the Super Bowl, you win the World Series, you can do incredible things. And that's where data scientists need to go. I'm going to close out with one story, um, and that is. Uh, uh, about a great old wise Japanese samurai warrior. And he had three sons. And he brought his three sons into the room. And he gave each of his three sons an arrow. And each son took the arrow. And he said, I want you to break the arrow. Son one broke the arrow. Son two broke the arrow. Son three broke the arrow. He said, very good. Then the Japanese samurai warrior gave each of his uh, sons three arrows. So each son held three arrows. And he says, go ahead and break the arrows. First son tried to break the three arrows, but he couldn't. 
Second son tried to break the three hours, but he couldn't. Fourth, third son tried to break three hours, but he couldn't. He said, you see, the lesson of this story is, is that alone you are vulnerable, you are defeatable, but together you are invincible, you're undefeatable. Data science is a team sport. Thank you. We only have a few minutes. I think you're going to throw us out at nine. Okay, thank you for coming. And we're going to the sink.